I made the most money on online work and that's really okay. appealing. Um, and I've had the most fun doing in-person work. Yeah. And I do think that there is a, there, even though I've made more money on online work, you can make faster money in person. So like I might make $10,000 a month on OnlyFans, not mm -hmm. at this point, but previously. Mm -hmm. um, and I could make $3,000 in 10 minutes <laughs> if I'm seeing somebody in person, you know? For so sure. it's like, it just kind of depends. But, and to be clear, like I have made all a, a range of money from like, I'm sucking dick for $300 all the way up to like, it's $5,000. And mm -hmm. some months on OnlyFans, I'm getting only $1,000 up to like, sure. I've gotten, you know, up to 30,000. So I want to sure. also be clear because I think that sometimes, uh, sex work can look like, oh, it's just so much money all the time. And that's certainly not true. Like Hello, sexies. Welcome to Sisters of Sexuality, Five Shades of Play. Today's episode is sponsored by OrganicLovin.com. Hello, sexies. You are listening to Sisters of Sexuality, Five Shades of Play. And I am Taylor Sparks, your host and sex goddess for the evening. We are here for the purposes of educating, entertaining, and informing you in all areas of sexuality, sexual health, kink relationships, and the business of sex. I am so excited to bring on a new guest as I am every week. But before I bring this gorgeous woman on, let me tell you a little bit about her. Raquel Savage is a Black queer therapist, educator, and sex worker. She facilitates trauma therapy through private practice in ZEP Wellness Center, a nonprofit organization she founded in 2019 that centers the mental health needs of Black queer folks and sex workers. She frequently leads lectures about mental health and sex work for undergrad, graduate, PhD students in organization, and teaches human sexuality to graduate counseling students. She also has the Savage University Archive, where all of her educational videos, hashtag thought-provoking thirst traps, uh, live streams, and more live, including her uh, hashtag sex ed series, a hands-on, informative, and real-life version of sex ed that fills the gaps for adults who missed out on early, ethical, and affirming examples of sex education. Savage also executive produces different projects for QTPOC, and sex workers through Kink Media Group, including uh, CVNT Productions, a porn production company that shoots exclusively Black, queer, and trans, fat, and disabled performers. Savage is also the co-founder of the Equitable Care Certification, a 12-week certification for therapists to learn how to work with sex workers as therapy clients. And she's been a sex worker for over a decade, doing both full service work and creating adult content online. Raquel, welcome to the show. It's always so interesting to hear like your own bio. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> like, yeah, I did all that. Um, I, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. No, I mean, girl, you have done a lot and are doing a lot. I don't even know how you find the time. <laughs> but, you know, of course, I always want to start at the beginning, like, Okay, so you have all this amazing education. You could have decided to do therapy for dogs or or cats, or <laughs> you could have been a vet, you know, and or, or artificial insemination for cows. But no, <laughs> <laughs> you chose sex therapy and education. So, I well, let's start at the beginning. Why sex? Why education? Yeah, I mean, for starters, my entire family is educators. So I don't even know that I had a choice, to be honest, and not by proxy of them like coercing me, just like it's in my DNA. And when I say all of my family, I mean, literally, my mother is a music teacher, her partner is a, a choir teacher, my aunt is a social studies teacher, my uncle is an English teacher, his wife is an English teacher, my grandfather was a college professor, and my mother was an asex uh, sexuality educator. Oh, so my goodness. literally, my whole immediate family all educators. So I think that from the beginning, that was always going to be a part of what I do, regardless of what the topic was, education. And then why sex? I came to that, honestly, no pun intended, um, because originally I really wanted to be like a Lala Anthony, like a 
like a VJ, like on what do they call you know, like a on fucking TRL? Is that like yeah, 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 I guess the video DJ a v, a video. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I I got my undergrad in business communications, and I couldn't figure out how to get a job. And so someone said to me, like, you need to figure out what your niche is. Like, what's your thing? What's your like? What sets you apart? And I realized the thing that sets me apart is that like everybody asks like my entire life people have asked me about sex and sexuality have felt that I'm like a safe person this is even before I even know what I was talking about but people felt that I was a safe person to disclose to um that I was knowledgeable about sex and sexuality I've always been quite a sexual or sensual person and so it was just always a part of who I was and I didn't really consider it a thing it was just who it was just part of my essence and so I realized, though, that maybe like that's the niche. And then I was like, OK, maybe I'll become like a sex therapist uh, personality. And then it just kind of evolved from there. And then simultaneously, I was also um, making the decision to start charging for my sexual services. Um, so that's how I started with sex work as well. So it was like a combination uh, uh, coming to of how to monetize and make into a career this part of myself that has always existed. Amazing. This is so good to know. So when one decides to charge for their sexual services and I, I, are you, you currently partnered, if I may ask? No. Okay. So as a single person, queer, and you meet people and they say, oh, what do you do? If they don't already know, if they haven't been, you know, following you on social media secretly. But like, <laughs> oh, what do you do? Like, you know, I don't know. I, I'm never on social media. Like, I know you've been on my stuff. So it's, and they find out what you do. Does this happen to you? They're like, oh my God, I could learn so much from you. And what are you going to teach me? And I'll tell you what I say, but what do you say when people talk about who, who seem personally interested in you, but yet they're asking you to teach them all of these things. Yeah, quite frequently people ask me what I do and I'm very forthright that I do. I either say sex worker, sex therapist. I say something about sex and sexuality and almost immediately people don't even go into questions. They go into like a story about themselves that is sexual. Um, and it's because they're wanting to be seen by someone who gets it. And I, and I totally yes. understand that. Yeah. Sometimes it's not, the, it's not appropriate. Like this has happened to me many times, like when I'm getting waxed, like my waxer is like, oh, hey girl. Okay. So tell me about yourself. What do you do? And then I'm like, oh, I'm a sex worker. Oh my God. So let me tell you. And I'm like, butterfly. My pussy is just like, and I'm like, all right, I guess we're getting into it. Frog leg, no yeah, you know, like spreading over my butt cheeks. And she's like looking at my asshole, waxing my asshole. And I'm like, oh yeah. So, um, so honestly, I listen to people's stories. I don't answer questions though. So, and I don't, and there's no like particular way that I go about it, but I'm like, okay, I'll be an ear for a bit and then I'll kind of change the subject. But if people are going into questions and stuff, I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure that I can answer that because I'm not your therapist, but I could maybe refer you to some sources or resources if you, if you need that um, is how I navigate it. But it's really just like unsolicited people are giving me stories. Oh my gosh. So, so true. And, and I get that too, but people like, like guys I've met, that may be like, like on a dating app or something. And I'm very clear about that. And they're like, oh, you're going to teach me so much. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, I don't teach personally. I only yeah. teach professionally. I can send you a link if you'd like to <laughs> sign up for a consult. Yeah. So with women, um, yeah, I'm definitely very, like the example I just gave, I'm definitely very like kind and I will love to hear people's stories. With men, with cishet men, I'm not fucking interacting at all. So if they're like, oh, oh, a sex worker, and I'm like, yeah, and they're like, oh, but that's I'm it's dead. I'm cut it's I'm deading it. So I don't yes. even I'm I'm very mean. <laughs> so it's You're I yeah, I don't mean. even I don't get into that that part with them. Yeah, I'm like, I know you think I have nothing else to do but to just spend my day teaching you shit for nothing and sex work, sex work is work. And yeah. so so again, when going back to the the as we were progressing through the, your your decisions, when do you, at what point was there something in particular that made you go? I need to start charging for what what services that you that you charge for? Yeah. Is it someone that said, um, "Why are you not telling these people to pay you?" And how was that transition uh, in the business being in the business of sex? Yeah, it was literally that I had just graduated from my undergrad and I could not find a job to save my life. 
I applied to jobs that were related to my field and related to my degree, couldn't get a job there. I applied to jobs that just needed a degree, didn't matter what field, didn't get jobs there. Applied to jobs that were like, you need to be educated of some capacity, didn't get anything there. High school, didn't get anything there. So it was like, I could not, I fucking, it, I, I even applied to like uh, Charlotte Roos and fucking Forever 20, could not get a fucking job. This was 20, what did I graduate from? 2012, I guess. Mm -hmm. um okay. could not find a fucking job and so it was like how can I generate income what can I do to make money what is my niche it was the same overlapping kind of thing what is my niche and at the time I had uh just started a like an anonymous Twitter account and it, I started the Twitter account just to stalk this dude that I thought was cute from Vine um which for <laughs> folks who may, maybe don't know what Vine is it was like the initial the original TikTok yeah, yeah um yeah. And so I made a Twitter account just to like stalk him, but I started like tweeting about sex stuff, but I didn't have my face or body or anything on there. It was just like an anonymous mm -hmm. kind of sex account. And it started gaining followers and I got up to maybe like 13,000 followers. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to see if I can get somebody to buy, like spend money through my, these horny people who follow me. And wildly enough, because men are just not very, like they just, what what's not clicking? This man who did not know what I looked like, or I guess it's an anonymous account, uh, came to my house and paid me $500 to fuck me, drove to my house. And first of all, I would never see clients in my house anymore. And right, right. Um, at the time, that was the, what I had, that, that was the situation. Um, and after that moment, I was like, I just made $500 in like five minutes. Right, exactly. I'm doing this now, because this is the thing that I'm doing now, and so right. it. Kind of I just, get it. I yeah, get the feel. It just grew from there, um, and I've done all kinds of sex work over the years. So I've done lots of full service work, and still do full service work, uh, mm -hmm. online work of all kinds. I did the premium Snapchat, did the OnlyFans, all of the things. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Do you have? Do you have a preference? between online and offline for, for whatever reason, because I mean, some people are just like, I just, the, the online is just so in person, you know, it's just so impersonal, you know, and some people like, I like the online because it's not personal, if, if you will. Do you find one better than the other or professionally, personally with either or? I mean, I'll say that I made the most money on online work and that's really okay. appealing. Um, and I've had the most fun doing in-person work. Yeah. And I do think that there is a, there, even though I've made more money on online work, you can make faster money in person. So like I might make $10,000 a month on OnlyFans, not mm -hmm. at this point, but previously. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can make $3,000 in 10 minutes <laughs> if I'm seeing somebody in person, you know? For so sure. it's like, it just kind of depends, but, and to be clear, like I have made all a, a range of money from like, I'm um, sucking dick for $300 all the way up to like, it's $5,000. And mm -hmm. some months on OnlyFans, I'm getting only a thousand dollars up to like, sure. I've gotten, you know, up to 30,000. So I want to sure. also be clear because I think that sometimes, uh, Sex work can look like, oh, it's just so much money all the time. And that's certainly not true. Like every like any other business, it ebbs and flows. Correct. And right. also, um, the majority of people who are doing sex work are not these like very lucrative online workers. The majority of sex workers are black and brown, unhoused, poor moms, uh, mm -hmm. disabled, queer and trans, street based. Mm -hmm full service mm -hmm. sex workers uh, who are trading sex for housing and resources and cash and not for very much of it. And that is fine. Like that is the majority of sex workers and yeah. to be centered in the conversation. There was one of the, I don't know if it was what uh, IG it was, but somebody was filming a bunch of young sex workers, young girls, they looked like they were just barely 18. I'm trying to think, I want to say it might've been New Orleans, but whoever had the camera was like, hey girl, hey, and you know, the girls would turn around and he was just like filming them. They were just really just out on the street, just waiting, you know, waiting for uh, work, if you will, chatting with each other. And, and I post, you know, I usually don't go to people's, when I see a post I don't like, I don't usually comment on it. You know what I mean? If it, if it's not, it doesn't relate to me. But I was like, 
why would you repost somebody else's video exposing these young women to their work, right? And clearly you could see on their face that they were kind of caught off guard because some of them immediately turned around. And so this clearly whoever videotaped them, this was not consensual. Yeah. Um, so, and then you repost this person's video exposing them to, to, to the danger, to the, this, their family may not know they're doing this. They may have part-time jobs, you know, or full-time jobs. They may be supplementing income and you're exposing their entire face to the world without knowing the context of why this video was even taken. Why would you repost it? Yeah. You people know? hate sex workers. Yeah, people hate, it's like, people people hate people sex workers. Post, they hate sex, but some people just repost shit for the, just for the, you know, to try to get traffic to their thing. But I'm like, and so when I see things that are negative to, especially to our people, black and brown people, I'm like, why are you reposting this negativity? You can't find anything positive to say yeah. when there is so much positive about us, including positive sex work. Yeah. You yeah. See? And and it's because people hate sex workers. And so even if people love black and brown people, people hate sex workers. And that transcends their love of black and brown folks. The whore phobia transcends any kind of gender race class sure. at the core of it. People hate sex workers. And that also includes people in the sexuality field. There are so many sexuality educators who, as much as they talk about sex positivity and erotic, sensual sex and whatever, whatever, they fucking hate and despise and are disgusted by sex workers. I have encountered this throughout my career many, many times um, that the people who are, who, who one would think uh, would be the most accepting and centering of uh, sex workers and erotic laborers actually are not. And that also includes uh, organizational bodies like ASECT uh, yes. who also do not, are not forthright about or not proud or loud about or do not center sex worker voices at all while also positioning themselves as sex positive. So whorephobia is in every single corner of every single organization, everybody's mind. It is everywhere. Yes. It is rampant. Yes. And yeah, it is really, really dangerous. I have found the same to be true about the swinger community. I present primarily in the ethical non-monogamous, more focused on the swingers and open relationship people. And I have found the bias of sex educators, as an educator myself, amongst um, sex educators, sex educators, um, amongst swingers. Because even Reed Mahalo, Mahalo, you know, Reed, uh, he, in his summer camp, this was the summer before, it would have been the summer of COVID 2020. He was asking me to come and teach a course for the educators about educating in the swinger community because there is so much bias. They turn up their nose like, oh my God, swingers. I'm like, these consensual adults and not only the, you know, probably 80% or more, at least 75% or more are married and yeah. the majority of them are in longstanding relationships without these issues of infidelity and all this other craziness and, and, and the most tested and, you know, it, and they still turn up their noses about, and that really surprised me once I transitioned from like corporate training over to sexual education to find that other sexologists and, and such were, were had a bias. Yeah. Because yeah. I've applied for, to present at ASEC for my own, and they were, mm, no, without saying anything, but I'm like, mm, yeah, I have enough letters behind my name for them. And yeah. <laughs> Very much Probably. so. Or, or, or they just, they didn't like what I was presenting. It could be one or the other. I never, I never know. So mm -hmm. hmm. interesting. I, yeah, I, I have found that bias. And it is quite surprising considering that we're supposed to be this, these open, accepting of all types of sex and sexuality. And a lot of us say we are, but then we're like. We God forbid somebody. Sells their pussy. <laughs> yeah, I'm just supposed to give asshole, not asshole. I'll just give it to every person who wants it for free. Like, sex work is work. <laughs> We'd like to welcome our newest sponsor, Motor Bunny. Motor Bunny was created out of restless curiosity and sheer frustration. After spending months looking for a sex machine that made use of connective technology and didn't cost a fortune, it was clear that a lack of competition in the category meant a lack of innovation and disturbingly sparse options. 
The Motor Bunny founder set out to fill a major hole in the industry. And in 2015, Motor Bunny was introduced as the world's first wireless Bluetooth and long distance controlled sex machine. Motor Bunny's mission is to empower creative sexual experiences by reducing the financial risk of experimentation. With powerful machines that vibrate all the way to 11 with attachments that can either rotate or thrust, Motor Bunny machines are ideal for unlocking creativity in your personal pleasure. Visit MotorBunny.com and use code 11 and receive $50 off of any of their amazing machines. That is MotorBunny.com with code L-O-V-E-N. So do you also do kink? You do some kink? You do any BDSM work or DOM work at yeah, all? Yeah, so I do some DOM, some DOM work, yeah, both in my uh, online work and in person. And how much do we enjoy the DOM work? Uh, I, I, I enjoy the damn work. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that I for me. yeah, I, I like it. I think that it's, uh, I didn't even really realize that similar to being a sex worker, when I first started doing this work, I didn't call myself a sex worker. I was just charging for sex. And then I started talking about it online and people started calling me that sex worker. And then I was like, oh, I guess that's what I'm doing. I guess that's what I am. And then similarly with uh, being a dom, I don't know that I ever really consider myself a dom. I'm just mean. I just don't like men. So it's going to show up in my ah! head, right? <laughs> like it's going to show up when I'm doing, like a, the things that are really popular of mine beyond like squirting videos is like my JOIs because my JOIs are mean. And that was not really necessarily intentional. Wait, it's wait, just, wait, what's, wait, okay. What's a JOI? What, what's a JOI? JOI is jerk off instructions. So that's like me saying like, I want you to grip your balls and stroke your cock or whatever the fuck. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and there's so many ways that you can do them, but typically I, yeah, I had leaned towards like, you don't deserve this and you're, da -da -da, and you're just like talking shit. And then I realized that that is also like a niche of mine. And that also shows up in my in-person work too, is I'm pretty direct and pretty straightforward. I'm not very cutesy, wootsy, whatever the fuck. I'm definitely not like, GFE girlfriend experience kind of a girl. I'm very much like, you're going to do what I want you to fucking do. And that's that. <laughs> and there's no, that's, that's the only way you're going to be breathing in my direction. Um, so I definitely, yes. yeah, I definitely enjoy it. I love it. Um, and more recently have gotten into um, these kinds of power dynamics with like white men specifically, which I think is even more fun <laughs> just personally. Um so yeah, yes. I find it pretty, pretty enjoyable. And um, I'm also wanting to do more Dom work specifically with um, non cishet men. So women and queers and femmes and all of the non-binary folks um, who want to do work specifically yes. around healing any kind of sexual trauma. Um, so creating experiences where there is a dynamic present and the intention of the dynamic is not necessarily like degradation degradation or humili humiliation it's creating a really safe kind of sensory experience to be reintroduced to touch and intimacy and arousal to work through trauma so i'm really wanting to move more towards that direction um versus just like spitting in a man's mouth and telling him he's a fucking scum of the earth piece of shit yeah <laughs> and and that that is I mean, I think we all in these in these past, I don't know. Well, let me ask you this. Maybe it's just me, but does it seem like to you that since COVID, 1,427,000 new coaches and therapists and counselors and sex goddesses and yeah. have all just popped up on the internet? <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. All talking, all spewing their, and I'm like, you get that information from that's not even on google the shit that you're saying like yeah you can find all kinds of shit on the internet but some of the stuff that i've heard come out of people's mouths i'm like that's not even on the it where did you you they just pull some of these things out of the air and there was a gentleman recently who was saying that men's sperm has the cerebral fluid in it and this is how and that and that the sperm goes to the women's brain and this is how they get dick up. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like I am someone who is is very 
serious about like disrupting any kind of system of oppression, which includes like institutions and this like idea of elitism and like who is credentialed and who is not. I think that's a lot of bullshit and not but. And sure. I think it is important that whoever is positioning themselves as any kind of an authority has some kind of experience, wisdom. And so I'm okay with that wisdom being outside of traditional academia. Like that's fine with me. And there has to be For some sure. wisdom and the wisdom can't be centered in patriarchal, misogynistic bullshit. It can't be soul ties yeah. and yes, yeah, seem into the fucking whatever. Like, what are we even talking about at this point? So <laughs> it is, it is frustrating because uh, people have, anyone can say anything. And this also presents another piece of this, which is like consumers and anyone watching content, we need to be learning better discernment around who we trust um, so that we're not, Mm. what's the word, pedestooling people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about and are intentionally doing harm uh, by positioning themselves as some kind of an authority figure and are only talking about bullshit. So it's like, I feel the responsibility is is on both sides. We need to be better consumers and have more discernment and not kind of be so, hmm, so eager to, yeah, retweet and watch and engage. And yeah, on the, on the educator side of it, like, I, I don't believe that we all need to be traditionally academia fucking PhD. And we do have to have some level right. of like experience right. that informs what we're talking about. For sure. For sure. What, so when you're, when you are teaching um, undergraduates, grads, PhD students with regards to sex education, what are some of the uh, either courses or subjects that you talk about to them? And then what are some of the, the, the most, either unexpected questions or, you know, the shock on their face or not shock on their face. Like, what is it that, what is, how does that work when in the college level? Yeah. So it's really interesting because I think that when people take a human sexuality course, they're expecting it to be really fun and really titillating. And they're going to talk about all kinds of sex, like sex and sexuality. And it's just going to be really fun. And I totally get that. And, and, and on one hand, I, I do want to create that experience for folks um because it's important to be titillated and fun and whatever however (laughs) if I am your professor and you're coming to me to learn about human sexuality whether you're a graduate excuse me a counseling student or not the first few classes that we have are going to be about systems of oppression we're going to be talking about what is a system of oppression Mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about how systems of oppression show up in mental health the first three or four classes are not going to be fun and titillating. They're going to be a lot of disruptive, unpacking, kind of destabilizing um, courses that allow us to destroy everything that you think that you know so that we can actually have space to rebuild the rest of it. So for instance, I cannot talk to graduate counseling students about sex work and kink and BDSM and swinging and gender identity, et cetera, if they don't know about whore phobia, if they don't know about queer phobia, if they don't know about um, Mm -hmm. homophobia, if they don't know about racism and how racism and sexuality are intersecting kind of issues. I can't talk to them about fat phobia and body. I can't talk to them about body issues without talking about fat phobia first and how many of these things come from colonialism and white supremacy and how in mental health, anything that is othered and deviant is considered bad. So we're talking about swinging and lifestyle and uh, relationship anarchy or whatever that that is. Even polygamy. (laughs) Correct. That is all considered problematic because it is in opposition to white Christian ideals around sex and sexuality. So we have to start there. So um, not unfortunately, because it is what it is, the beginning of my courses are kind of like stressful for students because we're doing a lot of disruptive kind of work and then it creates a really good space to be able to have the fun and titillating conversations about like fucking I don't know paraphilias and shit because we've done the dis- yeah. the, the unpacking first to be able to make space for you know because you know yeah going back to like the body issues 
uh, I ask students, like, if someone comes to you and they have uh, some kind of issue with their body and it's impacting their sex life, like, how might we help them? And often I hear students say, like, oh, we might help them get on some kind of a workout routine and maybe talk to them about what they're eating and um, talk to them about blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, let's talk to them about how fat phobia and desirability impact how we experience our bodies and how um, the entire mm-hmm. concept of being fat is considered non-sexual and that we as a society see fat bodies of, as undeserving of sex and sexuality and pleasure. Like, let's actually start there before we're getting into Ozempic and a fucking diet. Like, let's get into the system of oppression. <laughs> Not the Ozempic. That right. is everywhere right now, the Ozempic. I and I heard about it last October with a, with a client friend of mine. We were in we were going to be cruising out of Mexico and she stopped by a pharmacy. She's like, oh, I need to get some Ozempic because I'm using it to diet. I'm like, what is that? And she's a doctor. She's a retired pediatrician. And she was telling me that it was a diabetes yeah. uh, medication that that she was saying, like, well, I want to do that. And she's like, well, it's a shot. I'm like, it's a shot. I can't do it now because it's a shot and I hate, I hate needles. So I'm yeah. like, well, that leaves me out because I'm not shooting myself. So... But she said, no, you need to be taking it for like, you know, a few months. I'm like, I'm trying to lose seven pounds. She's like, it's a waste of your money. It's not, you know, stop eating so goddamn much. <laughs> like, yeah. That's the long way around to stop eating so much. So when when you have these discussions with them and about all these different phobias and the patriarchy, and if some of the, especially if some of these students are white and male and, you know. Majority of them are white women. Uh, oh, majority of them are white women, right? Yeah. So, yeah, they may be they may be in agreement, of course, regarding the patriarchy and 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 you know and you know let's you know fuck men kind of thing, but when you get to the the racism part and the systemic racism in in our country and how all of that trickles down to every other type of ism, what has some of the responses been? Have you found the most accepting? Have you found them like what you talking about, Willis or? <laughs> Yeah, what is so, some of their... yeah, I try to do a really good job of creating a space that's like, we're going to talk about real shit. And this is still a space that you can show up as your authentic self with questions about the thing. And I'm going to answer them in a, in a sincere way. I'm also really clear that I'm going to check people and I'm going to tell them when they're fucking wrong, like period, point blank. And so we talk through what is it like to be told you're wrong? What is it like to have experiences that feel dysregulating in your body? We go through an entire kind of conversation around how can we use coping mechanisms as we're having hard conversations so that we can be receptive to the information. Because when we have conversations that challenge our sense of self, we get activated. And when we get activated, we cannot hear what's being told. We cannot access curiosity. We cannot access empathy when we are dysregulated. So we have an entire conversation beforehand about noticing what it feels like in your body when you're getting activated, when you're getting triggered, how can you bring yourself down? How can you take a Mm -hmm. breath and then continue? So if you need to take a break, you need to get up and walk, Mm -hmm. if you need to get some water, whatever, do that so that you can come back and then be receptive. So we absolutely have that conversation. I think I do a good job of creating a space where, yeah, like it's okay to show up as yourself. And also I'm going to say when something is incorrect. Um, I also ground the conversation about white supremacy in the values of white supremacy rather than like, you're bad, you're a bad white person. So I talk about like, the values of white supremacy are fear based. The values of white supremacy include either or thinking, binary thinking, only one right way, um, urgency, and all of those values, I think, um, resonate with people and they see how they show up in their life. So as opposed to the conversation being like grounded in like white people are bad, it's grounded in like, oh, I see how these values of white supremacy are showing up in all of these ways. And I agree that they're bad. And so it, it, I think it externalizes it, externalizes it a bit so that it feels more uh, approachable and digestible. And then, yeah, sometimes we do have conversations about whiteness as a construct and what it looks like for them specifically to uphold that. How have they been problematic because of their whiteness and specifically their white woman, their white femininity, right? Like their white saviorism, their whole yes. whatever. And the fragile, we have- the fragile, fragile white woman. Yes. So we have tough conversations. And for the most part, for the most part, I have not really had many problems. And I th- and I say that I think because 
when people have questions or pushback, we just talk about it. So it, it, it's not, it's never experienced as like, you know, uh, it's like they have a concern and I'm like, yeah, let's talk it yeah. through. Like, let's have a conversation about it. And I, and I understand it's a tough thing to sit in and, and feel through. And I understand it's tough to recognize how you have perpetuated this system. And I, I recognize it's tough to accept how you are uh, ongoingly for the rest of your life going to need to check this part of yourself. Like, so mm-hmm. yeah. Do you find in teaching these classes, these courses, um, and I'm assuming you get some satisfaction out of teaching them not to make anyone, you know, become, you know, woke or aware, but the fact that there are people who are, who they purposely took this course to learn and then unlearn. And I'm, I'm, I'd like to feel as though there is some real satisfaction in that portion. Definitely. Like these people elected to come in here to try to learn and unlearn some things about sex, sexuality, human sexuality, you know, racism, da da da, and all the isms. And so that must give you a, a really good feeling in that regard. Absolutely. One of the most like rewarding parts of teaching that class is uh, I have them do journals every week. Um, and the journals are just for them to reflect on. They're not shared with anybody just besides me, just for them to reflect on what came up for them during the class. Um, and it's, always so beautiful each week as we cover new topics to see them really working through and unpacking the things that they learn and reflecting on how grateful they feel to have been given new information. And particularly when they say things like, this is something that I always thought was true, but didn't have the language for. And now I do like that. I really, really, really enjoy that. And then Um, I have them do a final journal that's like a reflection of the entire course and have them reflect on like who they were before the course and who they are now. And if they're the same person, that's fine. Tell me about that. If they're different, tell me about that. And I think reading those journals are definitely the most rewarding because they see how useful the information that they learned was not only for them personally in their like inner world with their significant others and their family and also how it will show up in their professional work. Um, And that feels, I mean, it feels not to like toot my own horn, but uh, it feels really rewarding to have students say that like this class feels more useful than the other classes that they've had. And I'm glad because I was there, right? Like I was the student who was looking yes. around my classes and being like, what the fuck are we learning? Like what, is it, all of this is bullshit. Right. So I can imagine having <laughs> a class like this and them feeling like, wow, thank you for presenting this information. And in this way that is digestible and accessible. You know, you 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 have to toot your own horn because ain't nobody else going to put their lips on your horn. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Always teach your own one. So you were saying that that you know it's mostly white women. I don't know if it's just because of the area of, of where you live or where you're teaching that there's just more white people taking it than than people of color. It's or, because but, most therapists and, are white women. Because most therapists are white women, right? Like yeah. most school teachers are Correct, exactly. white Same women. Thing. And 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 my background in human behavior, I did you know this this and realizing that. Our little black boys, our little brown boys, especially brown and black boys, are literally educationally ahead of everybody else up until about fourth grade. And it is by the fourth grade where they are deemed, you know, uneducated. They need to be on some kind of Ritalin. They almost all of them, when they're diagnosed with something being wrong, it happens around the fourth grade. They become unruly. And and most of their teachers are white women. So now these boys are starting to grow. And I think that the white women get triggered and they must have some form of control over these little black boys who are going to become black men. And that's when they start the, the shutdown. I've seen it even happen to my own son. They're like, you should have him tested. I'm like, if we have tested, why? <laughs> For what? And yeah. I would get all of his teachers together and, and all through all of his schooling, same thing with my daughter. If one teacher had a challenge, I'm like, I want all the teachers together. Well, it's going to be hard to get the schedule. I don't care. Figure it out. But I want to have all of the teachers at the exact same time yeah. in a meeting. And that is the way 
to kind of single out which teachers you know that are who are working well with your child because you know it is some of it is personality and we tend to forget that educators you know are people too and they could most certainly not like a child yeah and and then a lot of educators i've found and this was more than 20 years ago a lot of educators were starting to take courses on learning styles but none of them took anything about teaching style. So they didn't know how to make the adjustment to their personality when they discovered someone's learning style was different than how they taught. I'm like, well, you only yeah. got one side of the coin. So I was actually going and teaching educators about DISC and their own personalities and how to make the adjustment. So, yeah, um, I mean, the the problem there certainly is not teaching styles. The problem there is white supremacy, like period. That, that, well, and so, <laughs> like, for, for, for that part, but I, you know, yeah, it's and it's really unfortunate because majority of of uh, white teachers and therapists um, who are working with any kind of children, but particularly with black children, yeah, they are disproportionately giving them diagnoses or encouraging them in the case of students, um, putting them in situations to get diagnoses. Diagnoses, I don't know the plural of that, um, that are considered more violent. Um, and more disruptive like yes. conduct disorders like ADHD instead of disorders that are given to white children like anxiety and depression. That is part of uh, right. how white supremacy is upheld in mental health, how it's upheld in academic spaces by proxy of mental health um, and informed by white supremacy. And the issue here is student, excuse me, uh, teachers and therapists not having any knowledge on systems of oppression. They don't learn about that. They don't have the opportunity to unpack or check their own white supremacy or how they have potentially internalized it. Um, and then they go out into the world and interact with clients and students and do harm. And do and do a lot of harm. So that being said, even though most of your, your students for the courses that you do teach at the college level are white, what would you say... Um, that the black community needs to learn about sexual education? Probably the same thing that any of the white students need to learn just from the, the angle of this is something that we have internalized rather than uh, we are the benefactors of it. So black folks also need to learn about white supremacy and colonialism and whorephobia and homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia, all of the things uh, from the perspective of we have internalized these things, we perpetuate these things, and in some cases are the benefactor of, right? So any kind of cis black man, for instance, who is uh, being transphobic is the benefactor of transphobia as well. So I definitely think very, very similar concept. All of these systems of oppression are important for black folks to learn. And then once they have un unlearned uh, all of these systems, figuring out how to consistently disrupt them in their life always and forever, and then rebuild uh, relationships to their body and sexuality that feel grounded in uh, systems that are in opposition to white supremacy. Um, so, and any kind sure, of kind of sure. embodiment and connection practices. So really the same things, honestly, just from a different kind of angle. From a different angle, yeah. So I do wanna know more though about your certification program for those that are looking to work with sex workers. Tell me about that program and you know what it kind of entails and what is the and what is the you know the outcome when someone finishes this this 12 week certification. Yeah. So it's a it's a 12 course uh certification program for clinicians and mental health professionals to learn how to work with sex workers as therapy clients because this is something that we do not learn in our graduate school. We don't talk about sex work at all. Um, and sex work transcends any of gender, class, race, religion, et cetera. So we learn about like counseling with black folks, counseling with gay and lesbian clients, right? But we don't learn about counseling with sex workers and sex workers can be any of those people. Sex workers can be black, sex workers can be gay and lesbian, sex workers can be Jewish, like it, can, it transcends all of those things. So um, yeah, we similarly to kind of what I just talked about for my students, we start with the unpacking. We start with working through what is the system of oppression, how does system of oppression show up in mental health, and then we work through defining what sex work is, 
how it is in distinction to sex trafficking. We talk about decriminalization. We talk about clinical concerns for working with sex workers and how we as therapists do harm and how we can not do harm. Um, we talk about all kinds of alternative interventions to ensure that the practices that we are utilizing with sex workers are actually helping to keep them safe and not harming them. Um, practices like mandated reporting, mm -hmm. disrupting that. Practices like involuntary hospitalization, disrupting that. We talk also about like uh, sex worker families and, and sex positive families and being sex positive generally and what that actually means, including sex workers. Um, and then any clinician who wants to be considered a certified provider will also work with a sex worker client for uh, three months, uh, offering a free therapy service with them. And then we check in with the client directly to say, how did it go? Did you feel supported and seen? And if the client says yes, then the clinician will get their certification and they are considered like stamped by ECC and considered a uh, yeah. sex worker affirming counselor. Yeah, yeah. That That is such a, a nice niche program. Um, because what is the other one that came out of right before COVID, right around COVID, the pineapple? Pineapple support? Pineapple, yeah, pineapple support. <laughs> Which I thought was great that when that when that came out, so someone that gets certified by you could then join Pineapple Support. Yeah, we're part of we're trying support. to they make get their, they could get their certification. Yeah, so right now Pineapple Support clinicians aren't like required to do any kind of extra training, and we would love to like hello Pineapple Support. We'd love to get them to require their clinicians to be ECC certified before working with Pineapple Support, which we think makes a lot of sense because they're going to be seeing sex worker clients. Yes. I mean, um, you're familiar with, uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, Jet Setting Jasmine, mm -hmm. King Noir. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so Jasmine is a clinical therapist. She's also a sex worker. She's also, a, you know, a master, of, you know, fetish trainer. She's, you know, she's a Gemini like me. We got to check all the boxes. Right. We're doing everything. Gemini, we're doing everything. And, yeah. and, and she is, you know, they both do, you know, working in adult entertainment and like you just hella fucking smart about what the fuck they know and making this all normalized. Yeah, because at, at the end of the day, we're all humans who have chosen to do this, this, that and the other. And we've all got some form of trauma, be it small or, you know, I was five and I got, you know, a puppy bit me in the ear and I've never liked dogs. since. It, it's something, you know what I mean? It's yeah. something even more. Massive. But you, Jasmine, you know, being able to make something that is considered so outside the norm normalize is just a wonderful, amazing thing. And, you know, and it's you and people like Jasmine that I learned so much from, even though I'm educating from the area of swingers and ethical non-monogamy and even crossing those platforms between open swingers, you know, polyamory, polygamy, and they're all fighting with each other. Like, oh my God, you do relationships. Oh my God, you just do sex. I'm like, oh my yeah. God, it's all the same. You know, yeah. it's like, let it go with all of these boxes. But I, I think it's, just great work that you do. And it is so needed and appreciated. And one other question I do want to ask you is, um, what does, as I'm starting to ask all my sex educators, because I'm, I'm nosy this way, but <laughs> what does sex mean to you? Yeah. Do you mind if I say something about Jasmine first? Please, no, say yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. also shout out Jasmine because Jasmine and her kids helped uh, consult with our sex positive families course in ECC. And we uh -huh. frequently have them as a guest for that course so that the clinicians in the class can hear directly from kids of a sex worker parent so that the clinicians can get an idea of like what it's like to be raised in a sex worker household. So yeah, wonderful, so big, amazing. huge shout out to, to Jasmine. She was a part of ECC and continues to be as well. Yeah, yeah, Jasmine King. Yeah, I've seen their um, uh, parenting with porn uh, mm -hmm. classes. And then like, this just makes such perfect sense because people are, let alone sex workers are porn, but, or sex work, you know, people just people finding out that you're polyamorous even, they're like, oh my yeah. God, what about the children? I'm, you know, kids are resilient, first of all. And and um, if you're just honest with them, they grow up okay and safe and secure. 
it's all, I think it's all the hiding and making it, especially here in the States, you know, because of the Christian, you know, tits are bad and nipples are bad and dicks are bad. Yeah. And well, not unless I decide, you know, and, you know, and you go to Europe and people are literally, they have bra commercials where the whole boob is shown on regular television. Yeah. And, let me digress for one quick second. I was recently at a local beach, but it was like kind of deserted, deserted, like way far away from the hotel zone down here in Mexico. There was where I was sitting with a gentleman friend of mine. The people were so far from us. We couldn't even and I was sat so far back from the water. We couldn't even tell what color their bathing suits were. So I'm like, oh, my God, I am going topless. <laughs> yeah. I hate to get some stupid tan lines, right? <laughs> this man was like, you can't have your top off. Like, There's nobody God forbid. You trouble. Well, there are people with kids. I'm like, they're way over. Well, you're just, you're, and he, the man was hyper, almost hyperventilating. I'm like, okay, so we're going to stop this conversation right now because I'm a grown ass woman. Yeah. Oh, you fuck. I yeah. don't anybody. And and first of all, I ain't even got big boobs. I'm laying them a goddamn back with my head <laughs> to the damn ocean. Once I'm laying down, they're just, you know, so I'm like, I'm like he's like, well, how would you feel if a Karen walked over here with a child? God and forbid I'm, children saw titties. <laughs> I'm like, if her kids can walk, they know what titties are. First of That's all, correct. Okay? Yes, and they second do. of all, why is she in my space as far as away from the water that I am? And I'm going to tell her to get the fuck on. Right. And we, I mean, the road stopped. You couldn't even drive up to the beach because the road stopped, right? I'm like, who's she going to go get? There's nothing. Who's she going to tell? There's no police up here. I'm like, I, but he just couldn't like get his head together with the fact that I was laying there with my top off. And I'm like, dude, we, we, we out of our fifties. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. But being raised in America, this whole concept of and I didn't raise my children that way. Like if my son, when he was little, if I was changing clothes and he walked in, I would not. Yeah. Out. I would be like, your mom's got tits. And most other women, you know, are going to have tits. You know, yeah. At one point, your sister's going to have tits. They're tits. Yeah. They're not designed. They were designed to feed babies, not for the sexual pleasure of men. That's right. It's okay. So, you know, my kids, bless their hearts, they're, you know, by the time they were in college and talking about sex and their friends are like, Oh my God, why are you so explicit? And they were like, why are you not? Yeah. Because they could freely talk about sex, yep. their own sex, their own sexuality, you know, and they're in their 20s, 30s. So, you know, the whole gender thing, they're like, hey. you know, we came out to them as being open, my husband and I. And they were like, oh, yeah, we figured something was going on. Yeah. I mean, they didn't have it <laughs> barely bad and bad and nice. So, back to the question what yeah. does sex mean to you, both either personally or professionally or? however you decide to answer that. What does it mean to you? Yeah, I think sex personally to me is around like playfulness and curiosity and sensory experiences and pleasure, you know, but a lot of like, I think there's not enough playfulness in sex. And so for me, yeah, it's like playfulness and pleasure. That's I think different from professionally <laughs> um professionally sex is about money <laughs> it's about increasing my bank account <laughs> with the bag yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you 100 percent on all of that all yeah. of that oh my god oh it's i can't believe that i was like gone so fast <laughs> Listen, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank friend. you. Thank you for having me. It, I mean, you are just a wealth of information and knowledge. And it is, I'm, I just can't wait to get this up. So listen to my amazing audience to stay up to date with Raquel Savage. You can visit her website to find out more information on her courses, her work, working with her at RaquelSavage.com, as well as her IG and Twitter uh, her Pinterest is Rack, R-A-Q, Savage, and her TikTok is Therapy with Raquel, underscore. And of course, all this will be in the show notes. And to stay up to date with Sisters of Sexuality, if you have any questions for me or any of my guests, you can email me at sistersofsexuality at gmail.com. And you can find us on all social media, on IG, Facebook, Twitter, Sisters of Sexuality. By all means, please visit our sponsors, our sister site, uh, Organic Lovin', L-O-V-E, 
N.com. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And if this episode re uh, resonated with you, would you please consider subscribing as a way of supporting the growth of our podcast and or our YouTube channel and allow us to keep informing, educating, and entertaining you. And until next week, stay safe. Bye-bye. Organic Lovin'. For the bodies you love to love. How do people describe you? Are you curious? Playful? Maybe sensual? Adventurous? How about open-minded? The truth is, no matter who you are, Organic Lovin' has something to indulge your fantasies. We offer only organic, natural, and eco-friendly intimate body products, including vegan condoms, organic lubricants, body-safe sex toys, and sex-positive books. You won't find anything harmful in our products or toys. We also have a full range of other experiences, including erotic seminars and exotic adult-only vacations. Receive our adult subscription box for a monthly sexual delight. Be educated, entertained, and informed. Organic Lovin'. For her, for him, for you. For the bodies you love to love. Visit OrganicLovin.com. We offer shipping worldwide, so stop by the site anytime. Organic Lovin'. That's L-O-V-E-N dot com. <laughs>